The entire weight of a train, sometimes thousands of tons, rides on a contact patch the size of a 10p coin. It's where steel meets steel, but how does this tiny interface manage safety, comfort and efficiency across millions of rail journeys? By the end of this video, you will understand the importance and power of this interface and how it makes train travel so efficient. We'll start with what the wheel rail interface actually is and why it's far more than just a wheel rolling on a rail. Then explore the profiles of both wheels and rails, the forces at play and how this tiny contact patch helps steer trains through curves. We'll also look at the issues that can arise and how engineers maintain this crucial interaction. Ready? Let's get into it. The wheel rail interface is, as the name suggests, the area where the train wheel meets the rail. It is one of, if not the most important, interactions between components on the railway. A lot happens in this interaction. The load of the train, which can be huge for those heavy freight trains, is transferred onto the rail and then through the track system to the ground below. The interface also provides the traction and braking giving the train the grip it needs to move and stop. So far, that's similar to a car tire on the road, but here's the difference, guidance. A common question is, how do trains steer around curves? A very large part of the answer lies at this interface. If those are the major headline functions, we cannot forget about what else is going on. The interface plays a major role in ride quality, noise level, and rail wear. And then there's safety. Since this is how the train physically connects to the track, it's crucial to ensure everything is functioning correctly. But here's the most amazing part about the wheel rail interface. All this happens in an area the size of a 10p coin, or about one centimeter squared, tiny. All that force focused through an area roughly the size of your thumbnail. Look at your thumbnail for a second and let that sink in. With such a small area and such high force, the pressure of the contact patch can reach over a thousand megapascals. That's about 145,000 PSI for the Americans and Imperial System fans watching. Sounds like a lot? Well, your average car tire is inflated to around 35 PSI. That means we're talking over 4,000 times the pressure, all in that tiny space. The contact patch is small, experiences extremely high forces, and has a huge influence on the performance of both the train and the track system. It's one of the key reasons rail transport is so efficient. The small contact area results in much lower rolling resistance compared to other modes of transport, such as cars. No surprise then that this interface is one of the most heavily researched areas in railway engineering. Now we know what the wheel rail interface is, let's look in a bit more depth at the parts involved, the train wheel and the rail, concentrating on their shape. Both the wheel and the rail have what is known as a profile, their shape, and it's how these shapes interact that determine what happens at the wheel rail interface. Balancing wheel and rail profiles is a bit of a trade-off. What's good for the wheel and the train might not be great for the rail or the track, and vice versa. It's a compromise. It's all about finding a middle ground that benefits the system as a whole. Let's look a bit closer at the wheel profile. Train wheels have several distinct areas. There's the tread, the main running surface. Then the flange, the raised inner edge that helps guide the train. And between them is the flange root, the curved transition area. The wheel tread isn't flat. It's slightly conical. That means it tapers in circumference with a larger diameter near the flange and a smaller one towards the edge. This shape helps steer the train, which we'll touch on later. On the other side of the interface is the rail, which has its own shape. Rail profiles have evolved over time. And while there's still several versions in use today with subtle differences, they all generally follow the same principles. The rail head includes several surfaces, but when it comes to the wheel rail interface, there are a few key ones we're gonna focus on. These include the gauge face, the gauge corner, and the crown, also known as the head of the rail. When the wheel and the rail profiles are well matched, the wheel runs mainly on the crown of the rail, without contacting the gauge face or corner. Rails are typically inclined at a 1 in 20 angle. This helps align the contact area with the wheel tread and ensures the vertical forces are directed more efficiently through the rail's web and into the track. The position of the contact patch on the rail head can be influenced by track geometry, especially by the application of cant on curves. Poor geometry, poor maintenance, or mismatched profiles can all lead to similar problems. The contact patch on the wheel may shift slightly closer to the flange or flange root, sometimes even resulting in the flange contacting the rail. This results in high wear on both components, especially on the rail's gauge corner and face. This is typically known as side wear. Then there is the matter of force distribution. 
poor contact leads to uneven force spread, which increases stresses and raises the risk of defects, like rolling contact fatigue. Once this cycle starts, it feeds on itself. Wear changes the contact, which worsens wear, and so on. But don't worry, later in this video, we'll look at how engineers correct this. We've touched on the high forces at the wheel rail contact. Now, let's break them down in a bit more detail and look at how they steer trains around a curve. First, there are vertical forces, also known as the normal load, acting perpendicular to the rail surface. This is the weight of the train, transferred through the wheel, and it can amount to several tons per wheel. When you think about how many wheels there are per train carriage or wagon, and how heavy trains can get, it does add up quite quickly. Next are lateral forces. These act horizontally, especially when the train is navigating curves or experiencing uneven loading. If large enough, these forces can push the flange into contact with the rail. Then there are longitudinal forces, which act along the rail's length. These are principally generated by the train's acceleration or braking, and resisted by friction. Managing that friction is a key part of controlling the wheel-rail interface, and we'll come back to that shortly. Even when a train is rolling smoothly, there's a tiny mismatch between the distance the wheel travels and the distance the rail moves beneath it. When the wheel is under traction, or forward motion, it will rotate ever so slightly more than expected. Similarly, if the brakes are applied, the wheel will rotate ever so slightly less than expected. This microscopic slip is called creep, or creepage, and it occurs within the contact patch due to microscopic elastic deformations. Some creep is actually needed as part of braking and traction forces, but it must be controlled, otherwise it increases wear. You can't steer a train's wheels like a car, but in tight curves, some rotational forces, or yaw moments, do develop at the interface, as the wheel set rotates slightly relative to the rail. Lastly, there are impact forces, the sudden, sharp increase of force caused by issues with the track, such as voiding, other defects, or the presence of rail joints. These are highly localised to the area in question, and can cause damage to both the train wheels and the track. These forces acting on this interaction between the wheels and the rail allow it to undertake possibly its most impressive feat, the steering of trains through curves. Trains have solid fixed axles, with both wheels rotating at the same speed, and no built-in steering, unlike a car. When a train enters a curve, the inner and outer wheels need to travel different distances. The outer wheel has further to go. In a car, a differential handles this by letting each wheel turn at a different speed, but trains don't have that. So, how do they manage? Remember earlier when I mentioned the conical shape of a train's wheels? This is why. As the train enters a curve, lateral forces shift the wheel set sideways. This moves the contact point. The outer wheel rides on a larger diameter closer to the flange, and the inner wheel on a smaller diameter nearer the edge. So the outer wheel travels further even though both rotate at the same speed. Don't worry, the flange is there to stop the wheel shifting too far and falling off the rail. The rail profile also plays a role in this natural steering working together with the wheel profile to allow smooth transitions into and out of curves, all while keeping the contact patch stable. When you consider that hundreds, even thousands of tons of train are steered through curves by the interaction between a well-designed wheel and rail profile, all within a contact patch the size of a coin, it's pretty incredible. But, as you might expect, there are some problems that can arise. We can roughly sort the problems into two camps although they're often closely linked. There are dynamic problems and then material damage and wear problems. Starting with dynamic problems, one issue is when a sudden, high lateral force occurs, such as from a track geometry fault. As designed, the wheel set shifts across slightly, then self-corrects back to the centre. But, if the force is strong enough, the wheel set can overshoot and begin to oscillate side to side before stabilising again. This is known as hunting, and it can cause wear, vibration, and even safety issues. Poor rail and wheel profiles make hunting more likely, as they destabilise the contact patch between the wheel and the rail. I've got a full video on hunting if you'd like to dive into it deeper. The second dynamic problem can occur on tight radius curves. These increase what is known as the angle of attack, the angle between the wheel set and the rail. A high angle of attack causes the wheel to press more aggressively into the rail, increasing wear and degrading the interface. I also have a full video on angle of attack if you want to learn more. Moving on to the material damage and wear. Rail defects come in many forms, from internal manufacturing flaws to corrosion caused by environmental exposure. But here, we're focused on defects caused by the repeated passage of wheels over the rail. As the wheel moves over the rail, creep and friction cause wear. Depending on the location of the contact patch, this can flatten the rail head or cause wear to the gauge corner, known as head and side wear respectively. As we've seen, this changes the interface in ways that usually makes things worse. Another major defect linked to the wheel-rail interface 
is rolling contact fatigue, or RCF. These are microscopic cracks in the rail steel, initiated by high pressures at the contact patch. Over time, repeated loading causes them to grow, and if left untreated, they can eventually lead to rail failure. Two less talked about defects are corrugation and lipping. Both involve the movement of rail material. Corrugation creates a ripple-like pattern along the rail, interrupting smooth wheel running. Lipping causes material to flow towards the rail's edge forming a lip that can be then torn off by passing wheel sets, damaging the rail. If you're finding this video interesting and want to learn even more about the railway and the engineering behind it, I've got two free resources for you. First, I have a free six-day email course that breaks down the fundamentals of horizontal track geometry, perfect for building a solid foundation of knowledge. Second, just for signing up to my email list, I'll send you over my free Guide to Kant ebook. Kant is one of the most crucial concepts in railway engineering, and this guide will give you everything you need to understand it clearly. Both are completely free. Just check the link in the top right hand corner or in the description below to grab yours now. A topic that brings in track maintainers, train drivers and operational staff is adhesion. Adhesion is the friction grip between the train wheel and the rail. It allows the train to accelerate, brake and keep moving all without slipping. Fairly crucial, I would say. Adhesion depends on the level of friction at the interface and it's a balancing act. Too little friction and the train wheels may slip, spin or slide when braking or accelerating. Too much friction and the wear increases on both rails and wheels. It also raises noise and reduces the efficiency of the interaction between the wheel and the rail, increasing energy or fuel consumption. Under good conditions with clean, properly profiled wheels and rails, friction levels are just right. But several factors can upset that balance. First up is the design of the track. Areas like the tight radius curves I mentioned earlier or steep gradients on track. In the case of the tight radius curves, these increase the levels of friction at the interface, which leads to higher levels of wear and noise. Ever heard high-pitched squealing on your underground or metro train? This is likely the cause. With steeper gradients, the higher levels of traction or braking needed mean that more friction is required to avoid wheel slip. Second is the surface condition. Similar to changing conditions on the road, like rain or ice, change how your car brakes and accelerates, Rails are no different. For rails, the main culprits are wet rails, the pulp caused by leaves being crushed on the rail head, rust, or anything like oil that might be leaking from passing trains. All these reduce the level of adhesion for trains and have to be treated or removed. This can be done through railhead cleaning with chemicals, dry ice, high pressure water, or even lasers. Trains often carry sand that can be applied to the rail surface to help increase friction, which they can use as and when required. As with any system, the wheel-rail interface needs to be maintained to keep it performing well and safely. Certain factors, such as the overall track design, can only be addressed at very rare intervals, mainly when the track is being renewed. At this point, engineers and designers should look at the issues that have been occurring in a section of track and try to address them. But in the intervening periods, maintainers do have options. We have stressed the importance of the profiles of both wheels and rails in this video, so we'll start there. Wheels are inspected regularly and can be reprofiled to address any wear that may have changed that wheel's profile. Rails with a poor profile can be ground with grinding trains to get them back to the proper profile, or if they're really bad and beyond saving, they can be changed. Maintaining the design track geometry also has a big effect. A lot of time and effort goes into designing how much cant is applied to a track and a curve's radius. As the track ages and is used, it can degrade and move away from this design. Using tampers and other machines to correct track geometry will ensure that the forces acting on the trains are as designed, which in turn improves steering and reduces the forces at the wheel rail interface and onto the rails. On areas of track where less than ideal track geometry is required, such as tight radius curves, harder steel can be used to prevent the rails wearing or lubrication applied to reduce the level of friction. Then we come to ensuring the correct levels of adhesion, which we covered earlier where regular cleaning can remove any contaminants that have found their way onto the rail head. Managing the interface means managing everything it touches, from geometry to surface conditions, and every small improvement can make a big difference. In this video, you've seen how the wheel rail interface is more than just where steel meets steel. It's where weight becomes movement, shape becomes steering, and the contact becomes control. The fact that all of this happens in an area smaller than your thumbnail, that's railway engineering at its finest. Let me know in the comments what part of the wheel rail interface surprised you the most. If you found this fascinating, do check out my videos on hunting, angle of attack and track geometry. There's always more going on beneath the surface. 